The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Behind me here is the new and improved, I don't even want to call it improved because it's really just a little bit different than the other one. Uh, frankly, I guess maybe if I had the same setup I had before, I might just build the same one that I built on the show. I mean, it's not like this one was, or the other one was bad. I just needed something that was a little bit smaller, something that uh, goes together a little bit faster. And just some of the things that I've learned over the years, the importance or maybe lack of importance in something being completely 100% dead flat uh, sort of played into my approach for how I decided to build this one. So of course, like usual, we have a nice torsion box top, all right? That's pretty standard. Uh, a, lot, a lot of you guys have those in your shops now too. Uh, the original idea came from David Marks. Um, he did it on Woodworks and I kind of copied that uh, when I built my old one and this one is really along the same lines. The inside of this top here, this is about three inches thick, the inside is a grid work. And I did put a post on the website about that that I'll link to in the show notes that shows a nice picture of the grid work. You're basically thinking, you think of like a honeycomb structure uh, where it's very light, but it becomes very strong when you take that uh, grid structure and you put a skin on both sides and you attach that skin to both sides, it becomes very, very rigid. And that's sort of the concept behind the torsion box. So what I have and what I did differently on this one is I went with fairly thin grid pieces, about an inch and a half in width. So that's much thinner than we went on the original design. Uh, part of the reason was I just didn't want to deal with so much heavy material. I wanted the top to be a little bit more manageable. The other one was a serious challenge for two of us to move. This one was a lot easier. Now, the other thing is I went with ultralight MDF. Uh, it's a lot like regular MDF, but it's a little lighter. Uh, basically, a 4x8 sheet of ultralight weighs, it felt like just moving it, it felt like it weighed about as much as a regular piece of 4x8 plywood, uh, which is significantly lighter than your standard regular MDF. That stuff is just, it's so dense, it's incredibly heavy. So I figured, you know what, let's make it out of ultralight MDF. Uh, the stuff tends to be a little bit, you know, because it is lighter, it tends to be not as structurally sound, but this is MDF. I would never recommend using this on anything where structure is really that much of an issue. This is an internal grid work that really won't necessarily have any specific uh, stresses on it that rely on this being a super strong piece of material. It's the whole thing. It's kind of like when you think about like an eggshell, for instance, that can't, uh, you can't crack it when you put pressure from the top and bottom just because of the physics of the situation. It's a similar thing here where the materials that it's made with are fairly light, but the structure itself is very, very durable. Okay, so the top skin is a half inch uh, MDF. No, I went with um, three quarter on all of it. So the grid work is three quarters, uh, the top is three quarters thick, and the bottom skin is three quarters thick. Another big difference was I made it on my workbench. I decided that I really didn't need to go the route of like um, the saw horses and making this absolutely perfect dead flat starting surface. My bench is pretty darn flat to begin with. Um, so I used that as sort of the base and built upon that. And when it was all said and done, I did really well. Um, I was, you know, wasn't really expecting it to be absolutely perfect, but in the center here, I have pretty much no gap at all. It's dead flat from one end to the other. On my ends, it's just a little bit off. It's not perfect. I've got a few thousandths on each side, but it's pretty flat for the inner, I don't know, maybe 30 inches. The center 30 inches is pretty much dead flat. Same thing on that side. So ultimately, it is flat enough. I mean, the real thing is I think we tend to overestimate the need for a dead flat surface, especially during assembly. Because think about it. If you are assembling a project, you've milled your, your lumber square, your joints should hopefully be milled square. And when you put those joints together, most of these joints when fully seated are self-squaring. So by the time you're at the point of assembling something, you don't necessarily need this surface to be absolutely 100% perfect. You just need it to be roughly flat so that when you clamp your pieces together, you don't have something forcing your pieces out of whack. Uh, your workbench, you know, maybe that's a different story. Your workbench, you're doing joinery there, you're doing planing activities. You may want that to be a little bit closer to dead flat. 
Uh, your table saw surface, for instance, you want to be pretty close to flat uh, there as well because that's where you're making the joints. All right, but on the assembly table surface, quite honestly, mostly flat is good enough as far as I'm concerned. So I just didn't think it was worth all that extra effort that I put into the old one. So that's just something to think about. Oh, the other thing is a lot of people after the first build suggested that I stagger the cross grid pieces, okay? Because you're basically making this big grid work. And if all the cross pieces that get dropped in, uh, if all of those are in line with one another, when you go to drive a nail, you don't really have a space to put the gun to drive it in because there's another piece in the way. So I staggered them. Uh, based on a few suggestions I've had over the years. And the question is, how much does that, you know, does that really weaken the structure? I don't think so. Once you put those skins on the top and the bottom, it's going nowhere. And keep in mind, it's not like we're, uh, we're hanging this thing on a wall just, you know, by the end, like a floating shelf where all of the stress, you know, is present here. 90% of this base is, well, okay, maybe 75% of the base uh, is covering the, the real estate of this top. Most of it is supported. So the fact that it's a torsion box, I don't know how much that really even plays into it because as long as it's sitting on a flat, stable, fully supported surface, you're not gonna have much in the way of sag, stressing, or anything like that. All right, so I uh, skinned the whole thing with some three quarter inch purple heart. Um, why? Because it's really dense, it's really hard, and I've got an MDF top here, which can be easily damaged. So uh, it's nice to have a nice hardwood edge all the way around. And I happen to have some purple heart that was heavily weathered. Uh, my buddy Ron gave me a couple pieces of it that I don't know that I would necessarily feel comfortable putting it in a final you know, furniture project. Uh, the assembly table is, is not a bad option for that stuff. Screwed in, um, haven't even filled the screw holes, don't know if I will. Uh, big difference here, the top does not have a replaceable skin. On the old one, I used a piece of hardboard uh, to do that. And for this one, I just decided, you know what? As long as I had that assembly table, I have never needed to change that hardboard top. But the hardboard top presents a few challenges in you know, making sure it sits down. Uh, would you use a screw? Do you use some brad nails, which then become a problem when you go to remove it later? So I decided not to do it. I made it actually much more like David Mark's original design because he didn't have a replaceable top on his. So my MDF top is now flush with my sides, got a nice little round over here, and frankly, I am happy as a pig and poopy. The top has a few brad nail holes in it where I uh, you know, basically just drove some nails through there, not worried about them, I could barely see them, and they're not gonna interfere with anything, so I didn't even bother filling them. I just finished the top with, uh, I had some leftover clear penetrating epoxy sealer from the Adirondack chair, and I decided to, because uh, I don't want it to go bad, I decided just to soak that into the top, did two coats of that, and let that cure for a couple days and hit it with some high performance uh, general finishes, water-based finish. And it's beautiful. All right, the base, well, here's the thing. The base can be anything you want it to be. What, what kind of storage do you need in your shop? That's the t you know, type of base that you should include on this piece. For me, I had a couple specific needs. Number one, I needed a place to put my compressor. I can't show you that right now. I'll insert that into the video later, but the compressor is living on this side. Uh, over here, I have a nice shallow shelf. Let me bring the camera down a little. I have a nice shallow shelf here, and the idea is I could put glue up there. I could put uh, you know, little blocks that I use as calls. I tend to keep those in this little bucket. Well, it'd be nice to have some padded calls, really good quality calls right here on the shelf. Uh, down here, I'm probably gonna put some adjustable shelving in. I, I don't really know. It's, it's a future upgrade space, let's call it. Uh, right over here is a little garage. Uh, one thing that I like to do, even though I have my Festool MFT over there, I really like to have the overarm Festool deal uh, at this table too, because I will do a lot of sanding on the assembly table. So check this out. That's my little garage so that I could very easily slide my vac in like so, and that gives me plenty of room to maneuver the uh, arm over the table. Lots of space, this is now low profile, it's not in my way anymore. And you know, one thing you might wanna think about, if you don't have this set up with a Festool vac, make sure you make the height of this base so that um, my, my shop vac is all the way over there, I'm not gonna bring it here. I've got one of those upright rigid shop vacs. It's a great place to store your shop vac. Um, and the other side, like I said, I've got a compressor on one side and then another uh, bank of shelves, pretty much exactly the same as this. 
So what you want to think about with something like this is where else can you store stuff? On the sides is a great opportunity. I have nothing but a flat, empty surface here with some holes from where I drilled in to connect the, uh, the frame pieces of the base. And uh, I'm going to cover it with clamps. My workbench is going to change real soon. We're going to do the Rubo build in the, in the uh, guild coming up in January. I won't be able to hang my, my uh, small clamps on the, the trestle brace across the, uh, the middle there. So what I'm going to do is probably take all of those little clamps and put them right here. Uh, the idea is you really just want to think about what stuff you typically need when you're at the point of project assembly. And the things that you need the most, you know, your dead blow hammer, uh, maybe some glue brushes, the glue itself, small clamps are nice to have around. And ultimately, it just makes your glue ups and your assemblies go that much better if the stuff is nearby, so you don't have to kind of scramble last minute. Uh, so overall, that's it. Oh, one more thing. Whenever you do any sort of uh, table or work surface, in the shop, think about multitasking. Think about what else that thing might be used for and what it is you know, positioned near, because you could just by planning ahead, wind up having just about every surface in your shop the same height. You'd be surprised at how useful that can be. So for instance, I've got my Festool MFT right over next to the assembly table. And frankly, the assembly table's height can be just about anything you feel is appropriate. For me, um, you know, I didn't, this is actually not as tall as my old one was. I found, I had it at a surface that was good so that I could do things like this. Hey ladies, like that. Uh, but I didn't, you know, I'm married now so I don't really need that anymore. Um, seriously though, uh, the height of this, I wanted it to be a little bit lower because if you've got a, a big project, you know, large pieces of material that you're trying to work with, the higher this is, it becomes really difficult to get to the top. So if you're building a standard size cabinet and you're already starting, you know, 40 inches from the ground, that actually becomes really difficult to work with. So my recommendation is to go as low as you possibly can, uh, still giving yourself some storage in the base. But if it's lower, I can get right on top of this thing. I don't have to really worry about stuff being real tall. Uh, the, again, it just depends on how you plan to use it. If this is a surface that you're going to, you know, do your thinking at and drawing and drafting your projects or something like that, you may want it a little higher. But if it's purely assembly, I actually think lower is better. What I did here, though, specifically, was because my MFT is here, big old sheets of plywood are going to be run across this way. So it would be really handy if this was the same height as my MFT, and it is. So I've got it maybe, I don't know, a 32nd of an inch lower uh, than the MFT. So this is perfect for really, really long pieces that would overhang the side. Uh, I guess the only other thing that I would point out is at the bottom, I do have those heavy duty, uh, I got them from Rockler, heavy duty metal leg levelers. And they hook underneath the side, fully, you know, basically fully supporting it from uh, beneath the side panel. So the way it's stressing it is actually really good. It's not going to result in any long-term damage because it's got a little L-shaped bracket that goes under the side panel and lifts up from there. So you just turn it with a hex key, adjust it on four points. When it's uh, perfectly in line with the table, you're done. If you are doing something where you're trying to get the surface, this goes for like an outfeed table too, I recommend building it so that it lands about a quarter inch under the perfect height. So purposely build it about a quarter inch short, and then this way you can tweak it uh, once you get everything together. Let's try to get some questions about the table first, and then you know we could just hang out and chat about anything, whatever you guys are in the mood to talk about. Talk about some football about how I got my butt kicked already, first game in fantasy football. Which frankly, I'm kinda getting used to. It just wouldn't be fantasy football without Mark getting his butt kicked. Look at that. That's an 80 grit Festool coaster. Well, you know what, let me, before I answer that question, Bryce, because that's a great question, let me just mention a couple upcoming things. First of all, there's a charity build coming up uh, September 26th, and it may take two or three videos to get through the whole series, 
but we're gonna build a little um, rocker, a little kid's uh, rocking horse. The idea is for every person that builds a rocking horse, I'm personally donating a dollar to Livestrong. And we're trying to reach our goal of $10,000. So we've got quite a ways to go. We have a bunch of sponsors on board that are matching the donations. So if I, you know, wind up, if 200 people wind up building, I drop in 200 bucks, each of them drop in 200 bucks, and with any luck, we can get to our goal. Uh, the project is really, really easy. I just went to Home Depot and Lowe's today to look for the boards that they recommend. You basically use a pine shelf board, like one of those pre-laminated boards. It costs like $23. Uh, you just buy a 20 by 72 piece, and all of the parts for one of these units comes out of that one piece of material. Super easy, you just lay it out, cut the parts out, it's gonna be a breeze. But the cool thing is it's a great project if you wanna donate it to a, a local uh, charity, local children's hospital, whatever you wanna do with it is fine. Uh, but as far as the, the actual official donation goes, you send me a picture and then you get credit and then each of the sponsors and me uh, will all be putting a buck in per person, which is pretty cool. So that's coming up on the 26th and we'll have the plans available for you guys to uh, build along and Wood, Wood Magazine is sponsoring the plans. They're actually giving a, a set of plans that they charge for on their website. They're making them free for a limited period of time just for this build, which is pretty cool. The other thing I wanted to mention, and this goes back to Bryce's question, uh, he asked about the upcoming guild build. In January, we're having probably the most substantial guild build we have ever had. Um, it's, it's a big old workbench. We're doing a split top Rubo, the bench crafted split top Rubo design. And this is gonna be a doozy. It's gonna start in January, and if you need a workbench or if you're thinking about a workbench, this is something you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to. Uh, it's gonna be a great build. Aaron is already hard at work on the SketchUp drawing, and I can assure you that you will enjoy this one. This one's gonna be really good. Um, so that's coming up in January, and let me see if there's anything else. Oh, and I should mention that we have another live session similar to this one in a couple weeks, and I'm gonna show you guys my outfit table. Again, very similar to the original design that's on the website from um, Somebody Feed Me, is what I called it. Uh, but not different enough that I wanted to do a whole extra episode on it. So I'll be able to show you the details there and we'll talk a little bit more. Okay, so Bryce, you asked about the wood that is gonna be used for the workbench. You know, the thing is, there's a lot of different schools of thought about what type of wood is appropriate for a workbench. Some people like softer woods, some people like harder woods. Uh, you know, it's really hard to say what you should use. I mean, I know people who'd be perfectly happy using hard maple or ash uh, to make their workbench. And then there's other folks who just wanna use a Douglas fir. Maybe you have access to Southern yellow pine as a inexpensive but fairly dense alternative. Um, you know, one thing that we'll recommend is if you're on a budget, I would say pick something cheaper for the base. You need a substantial amount of material to build uh, the base. And that doesn't have to necessarily be as durable as the top does, all right? So I would do, I'm gonna give you guys resources. We've got a long time before the build actually happens and what I wanna do with that time is bring in some professionals, bring in some other guild members, talk about their benches, what they chose and why, and then we'll talk to some of the pros and even the guys at Benchcrafted to get their recommendations on wood species, uh, you know, varying it up a little bit. I can tell you most likely I'm gonna go with soft maple. It's a nice compromise, a little softer than hard maple, not quite as you know, soft as some of the other choices, I, I fall on the side that wants a little bit more of a harder work surface, personally. Some people just like it to be soft so that if they drop their project on it, um, their project doesn't get dented. Me, personally, I think the other way around. I would rather have a bench that doesn't get dented and I'm just not gonna drop stuff on my workbench. Um, personal preference. So we'll cover all of that and we're gonna have a ton of information for you to consider uh, what type of material you want. I'll get it to you as soon as possible because I know you wanna stock it. Uh, get all of your material in the shop as soon as possible. Okay, what did I miss? Matt, you want me to build a mini version? <laughs> that's what the uh, that's what the Moxon uh, vice setup is going to be for. Someone suggested that the you know I could sort of have my bench double as a changing table. Just get his little legs and crank him in the vice so he can't. Uh, you know, can't get them out of there. Um, you know, okay, so the question is, would honeycomb, the, the type, we talked about a honeycomb structure, would a hollow core door 
be a suitable assembly table? Yes and no. If you found one that really is truly flat, and frankly, there is nothing wrong with taking a reliable straight edge into the home center and walking up to it with a set of feeler gauges and just getting an idea of, of how flat it is. Again, keeping in mind that it doesn't have to be perfect. So you know what, scratch the feeler gauges thing. I don't even know why I said that because that's kind of silly. You should be able to eyeball it and as long as it's not you know, crazy out of flat, yeah, I think a hollow core door makes a, a decent material. In fact, if you did a little Googling, you could probably find a ton of information in forums and blog posts about people who use a hollow core door for their workbench. Uh, certainly would be suitable for a lightweight assembly table if you find one that's flat enough. <laughs> All right, Phil, you made the chair and the dog chewed the crap out of the arm. Any advice on fixing the arm? Uh, well, you know, one good solution for fixing the dog would certainly be uh, removing its teeth. Um, that might be pretty effective. Feeding it and getting it to drink through a straw might be a problem though. Eat, eat, eat pureed food through a straw may be an issue. You know what, it depends on the extent of the damage. Generally when you're talking about a dog chewing on a surface, that's really, boy, that's crappy to repair uh, because it's a bunch of puncture wounds. It's, you know, it, it's really mangling the surface in a way that's difficult to fix. Um, I'll tell you what, send me a picture, Phil, and I'll see if I can give you a suggestion based on what I see, because there are things you can do. Uh, sometimes it may come down to taking a router and removing a full portion, and actually you gotta remove more wood to make the repair. You do more damage before making the fix. Um, so you may be able to do something like that, I really wouldn't suggest fillers and stuff, although that will work. If it was painted, that'd be fine, but fillers are just gonna create a major eyesore. So, um, boy, that's, that sucks. Sorry to hear that. Um, do I think that my table is not flat on the ends because it's not supported by the stand? No, I don't. I, I, because it was like that before I got it on the stand. I think part of the problem was I did this on my workbench. What's the workbench going to do? Only support the middle, so the outside did overhang. I did put a picture up on the website showing my setup. I actually took long, wide pieces of MDF. They were about six or seven inches in width and about six feet long. And I put them on the top or on the skin. And as I was creating the grid, I was moving these pieces with me and I clamped them to the surface to keep it forced in a flat orientation. So if, if you put enough of those on that bottom piece, as you go through and assemble everything, you're forcing it to be flat uh, and using the bench to pretty much support most of the weight. And anything that was sagging, I was able to bring it up. Uh, the problem is I still wound up with a little bit of sagging on the outside edges despite having done that. Honestly though, it's, I don't really see this being much of a problem for me. I'm not really too worried about it because it is a very small amount. So, uh, but I do think it is reflective of the surface that it was built on. Yeah, I mean, see, and, and my, my opinion on the softwoods um, and why I want to go with something harder is not even so much the, the issue of durability, it's more stability. At, and, and this may be a regional thing, certainly could be that. But anytime I have ever worked with something like Douglas fir, you know, I, I would love to be able to just go to Home Depot and stock up on some Douglas fir and make the bench out of that. Uh, but anytime I have had Douglas fir in this shop, even if I get the stuff that's kiln dried, air quotes, bunny ears, um, it, it just turns into a pretzel, all right? Maybe not that bad, but the pieces are never very stable for me. Whereas if I get a nice hardwood, a nice piece of maple, and I bring that into the shop, I could leave it here for years and it doesn't really move. If it does, it moves a very you know, minute amount. And I did build a workbench from Douglas Fir in the past years ago, and that thing was never flat. I mean, even after I uh, planed the top down, it always wanted to warp and bow on me, so it just put a bad taste in my mouth and I just don't want any part of it. That's not to say everyone's gonna have that experience, but that was my experience. So my personal bias goes towards more stable hardwoods. Uh, duck kisser, is it possible to combine a heavy workbench with a contortion table? I'm picturing someone with their leg behind their head <laughs> Do you mean the, uh, the torsion box? So is it possible to combine a heavy workbench with a, a torsion box? All workbenches I've seen have had solid tops. It is possible. 
Now, whether it's advisable is a whole other story. In fact, do a search on the site for, uh, on the Wood Whisperer site for Torsion Box Workbench. We have one guy, and I can't remember his name, he built a torsion box structure for his workbench, and um, he went, you know, the whole nine yards. He was really into it, and, and he liked it. Here's the thing. Here's my problem with it. I've got a couple issues. Let me get uh, some examples for you. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear the difference here. A solid work surface, you got to think about what you're going to be doing here. If you're using an assembly table just to assemble stuff, or maybe you're using it for routing or sanding, any of these are non-impact exercises. So it really doesn't matter so much that it's dense or solid. Uh, but what happens if you start to chisel on a certain surface like this? It's hollow. All right, so every time you tap a chisel into the wood, there's flex, there's give, there's vibration that travels through. So your hits from the chisel to the wood are incredibly ineffective. And if you've ever, even on a workbench, if you've ever uh, clamped a workpiece down that wasn't perfectly flat, or maybe there was a piece of wood underneath it, and it was you know, just up from the surface, just a hair, and you try to chisel it, you get that slapping sound where something else is absorbing the blow, and you're not able to get an effective uh, chisel hit into the wood. On a workbench, however, that's you know, four inches thick, it absorbs everything you throw at it. So every time you put that chisel on the surface and you tap down, you're going to get all of the force transferred through the handle into the chisel and into the wood. So a hollow structure doesn't really allow for that. That's one major problem that I have with it. The second major problem is clamping. A workbench needs to be good at holding work. You've got to be able to put force on the outside edge, put force downward. We're talking about a hollow structure here. If you remember at the beginning, I mentioned that it's made with lightweight materials that, uh, you know, as a structure, it becomes very, very hard or very fairly durable. But that doesn't mean that it can necessarily take long, um, you know, high degrees of force in certain areas. It's hollow and it's just MDF. I mean, frankly, if I found a spot that was between my grid just with this hammer, I could very easily plow right through that and put a hole in this thing. You know, so if you're trying to clamp stuff to it, or maybe you're trying to put dogs in there uh, to, to have some sort of a, a vice on here, those dogs could very easily wear out an MDF. So, so now it is possible, but what I've seen people talk about doing was reinforcing the areas in which they know they're going to put dogs and that they're going to put clamps. Okay, vices and things like that are very heavy. So if you just hang that on the end and it's just MDF, you could be asking for problems down the road. But if you reinforce that area somehow before you put the top skin on, uh, maybe use some plywood in that area, build it up so that it's almost completely full. Um, you know, for the, for the uh, chiseling problem, this was just an idea, but I thought it, it turned out in my head, I was just thinking about it, that it would probably be a really bad idea, but it was interesting for a moment at least. I thought about what would happen if you filled the whole thing with sand you know, and use the sand as something that would absorb the pressure, at least that would handle the chiseling issue. Well, then I thought about what a disaster it would be as sand, you know, leaks out of all the little uh, cracks and everything like that. But <laughs> aside from that, it would turn what's already a super heavy top into something that you would need like five people to move. So I was like, eh, maybe that's not a great idea. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on that. It can be done, but you have to take certain precautions for a surface like this to be usable as a true workbench. Uh, someone asked about what, what is a good all-around hand plane? I, well, you know, you may have already gotten answers, but that's, that's a really hard thing to answer because it really depends on what you want to do. If it's your first plane and you've already got some power tools in the shop, a lot of times a simple block plane is a great option. If you're trying to build your collection of, of planes in general, you know, you may want to go with like a, I don't know, what would you guys recommend? Like a low angle jack or something like that, where you can get different blades, change the bevel angle just by changing the blade, you get a little bit more out of that particular tool. Might be my suggestion. You know, and, and for me personally, as that sort of power tool, uh, you know, power tool, hand tool hybrid woodworker, for me, the tools that I recommend buying first are actually very different. I don't usually recommend going for the bench planes 
necessarily as your first planes. The bench planes excel at doing a lot of the things that my power tools already do. So for me, as a mostly power tool user, I want hand tools that do things that my power tools aren't necessarily as good at doing. So I go for a lot of the specialty planes, the router plane, the rabbit plane, um, you know, shoulder plane, spoke shaves. You know, those things become the most useful for me personally. Um, you know, while we're doing nothing here, I will pan around because I know some folks asked about the other stuff that I've built. So I've got the, the MFT chilling out there. I've got some ideas. I want to do something a little different for this. I don't know how many of you really care about Festool specific conversation, but what the heck. My problem with this is I don't have enough uh, depth in this cut from the fence to where the, um, the piece that catches, that catches the rail. So I want a little bit more depth out of this. My idea is to turn this 90 degrees, put the fence on the short end, and then use a longer rail, you know, something like what I've got on the wall back here, uh, giving me much more depth and I could put much wider pieces on this. The problem is I now have much less in the way of support on both sides of the table itself. This certainly solves one problem because this is already the height of the table. I'm not so sure about the other side because this extension won't go on one of the long sides because it has to be supported by the rail at the bottom. So that's one thing that I'm considering doing. I might, I don't know, it seems like an, a major luxury, but I may actually consider buying a second MFT to put alongside there. We'll see. I don't know if I could justify it. But hey, I mean, really, like 75% of the stuff in here, most people wouldn't justify. And that's what makes us woodworkers crazy. Uh, here's the outfeed table. I can't get you any closer than this, but it's really the same structure as the old one. We'll go into detail on that in a couple weeks, but I don't really ask too much out of an outfeed table. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you see that? That's an umbrella. And we have a leak right up there at the air conditioner. Look at that. So right where the intake is, there's a leak. And guess what happens? It goes drip, 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 right onto the table saw. So, <laughs> so it's been raining the last couple of weeks uh, periodically. So we have an umbrella here so that uh, if it does decide to rain, it just harmlessly drips off onto the floor until we can get the roof repaired. Um, frankly, I wish Diami lived close so he can cut me a sweet deal on some, uh, <laughs> on some roof repair. It's pretty lame, huh? All right, so let me show you the cabinets. I've got two banks of these. You know, you've seen one. It's the same thing as the other side over here. Um, some nice doors up there. I've got, uh, I've got to have to put a shelf up at the top. Got these little handles. They were uh, like a buck each at Lowe's. They were, um, I guess they were trying to move them out. Um, but they were good enough for the shop. You know, what do you need for the shop? I love this little area down here because there's, you know, there's things that you, that you need all the time and then there's stuff that, you know, you can kind of take a few minutes to, uh, to find it if you need it, but it's not something you want to grab. So all the stuff I need immediately, I can keep down here. All the other stuff, I've got plenty of storage up top. Went with that uh, maple trim around this nice alder face. Down below here, can you guys see down there? Yeah. I've got a nice shallow drawer. All of the drawers are not just full extension, they're over travel um, slides here. So they actually have, I think, an inch of over travel. So if you have a little bit of an overhang, something like this, I can actually get to the back of the drawer right there. I have two trays here. There's some finishing supplies, some of my special brew, some finishes here as well. Really sturdy, sturdy stuff. I mean, put an elephant on that. Uh, and then over here, I've got the double doors, some extra storage, and another, another drawer right here. So I've got one bank over here, second bank over there. And you know what? The last thing I could show you is over here. Some of you may remember I put a post in the forum not too long ago that's uh, talking about buying stuff instead of building it. 
I know it's sacrilege, but what are you going to do? Well, the place where I finish, you know, I, I prep my finishes, I really didn't need a lot in the way of like storage underneath. What I needed was a nice sacrificial work surface that I didn't care too much about and I was feeling really lazy. So I just went to Lowe's, no, Sam's Club, and they have this incredibly durable, sturdy metal base with a nice maple top. I wouldn't use this as a workbench because it's got a nice cup in it, but it certainly works great for mixing finishes and dyes. And I've got my little, excuse me, my little filter holder. So if I get, you know, finish all over the place, not too worried about it. And it came with this little rolling cart. Now here's the thing, I don't know about you guys, shallow drawers, I've got no use for them. I don't know what the deal is. I don't have enough things to fit into shallow drawers. Uh, so unfortunately, that's kind of a bust. The big drawer on the bottom I do use, but here's what I'm gonna do. This whole thing is on wheels. So my idea is to take this little maple top, and what I'm gonna do is take a piece of plywood, cut a big circle out of it, and use one of those little cheap Lazy Susan dealy whackers, attach that to the top, or make it so that it's removable, and then I could wheel this out over to you know, the door over here and actually have like a Lazy Susan turntable for finishing. So um, I'm gonna sort of you know, make use of this cart even though it's not, it's not ideal in terms of the structure of the drawers, but I could use it as a surface that I don't care too much if I get a bunch of finish on it. And if you've never uh, used like a, a finishing turntable like that, and if you're into HVLP and spraying, oh, it's a treat. It's so choice. All right, well, if you guys get a chance, um, go over to Matt's website, mattsbasementworkshop.com. Scroll down a little bit. A couple days ago, he posted his Moxin Vice build, uh, the Benchcrafted Moxin Vice. I haven't even had a chance to watch it myself, but I saw the preview. I was all excited about it, and I didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, but it's bound to be a good one, so go check that out. All right, so uh, don't forget, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do another one of these, focusing on the outfeed table and guild members. Uh, between now and then, I will be doing a little live demo very similar to this, entitled, Why My Bench Sucks. And that's going to sort of be an early precursor conversation uh, leading up to the bench build that we do in January. But I think it's important to establish what sucks about this bench before going into building a new one. So cool. Thanks everybody for coming out. How many people did we get out there today? Not bad, 52 in the chat. So there's probably more watching. Sweet, look at those numbers. God, you guys are awesome. Boy, with so many people here, I should probably mention Go to the, uh, the guild site, uh, woodwhispererguild.com. Uh, if you shop at amazon.com, go to our website, click on the Amazon link in the top right, and change your bookmark to our bookmark, and then any shopping you do at Amazon will help support the show. Uh, go see my friends at uh, renaissancewoodworker.com. That's Shannon's uh, website. Go see Matt Vanderlist at mattsbasementworkshop.com. Go see Tom Iovino at uh, tomsworkbench.com. Oh boy, I feel like I'm giving an Oscar speech. Who am I forgetting? There are just so many great people. Um, I think that's enough for now. Yeah. <laughs> shameless, it's absolutely shameless. Oh yeah, well we can't forget David Marks. David Marks, uh, through whom all things are possible. And that's djmarks.com and Powermatic, go to powermatic.com. And uh, they're, you know, they've been a sponsor of the show for a long time now. So, you know, hey, frankly, we should give more shout outs to Powermatic. If it wasn't for Powermatic, I don't know that a lot of what I do would even be possible. Um, Rockler is a sponsor of the show and keep your fingers crossed because we're about to enter into renegotiations for the, you know, the next year. Let's hope that goes well. Oh, and, uh, and check it out, we're having a, uh, revamping the Wood Whisperer store. If you go there now, it looks bad. Uh, but we got a whole new piece of software. We're gonna be carrying some of Charles Neal's DVDs. I'm working to hopefully get some of David Mark's DVDs in there. And we're gonna try to just sort of expand the product line a little bit beyond just like stuff with our logo on it, which is all cool. I mean, Wood Whisperer shirts and stuff like that are fun, but uh, I really like to get some other things in there too. All right, guys, have a, uh, have a great week. 
I'm gonna go, um, I'm gonna go get sober. Yeah, this pain meds really make me loopy. Have a great week.